1978, the first ever World Darts Championship was broadcast and it became an instant hit with TV viewers. From that point, Leighton Reese, John Lowe, Eric Bristow and Jockey Wilson all went on to become world champions. And then, in 1983, a qualifier turned up and sent shockwaves from the hockey in one of the most dramatic finals of all time. Two times world champion and favourite Eric Bristow faced a relatively unknown fresh face qualifier in the final. At Jolly's Cabaret Club in Stoke, a young Keith Della threw killer darts all week before curtailing the crafty cockney in the 11th set final. It went down to the wire, Bristow needing a ball to win, played safe as Della checked out on 138. It still remains one of the biggest shocks in the history of World Championship darts. My guest are the three main players on that Saturday afternoon at Jolly's. Already twice a world champion, the crafty Cockney himself was favourite to make it a hat-trick of titles. Eric Bristow did go on to win five world titles in total, but it still remains a mystery how this one got away. My next guest picked up the £8,000 prize money in the most dramatic style. Having picked up his arrows at the first time at the age of 15, Keith Della was just eight years into his career and qualified for the World Championships, and during the finals blew away the former World Champions John Lowe and Jockey Wilson to set up a David against Goliath contest, which ended in a famous checkout in the final set. Our final guest commentated for TV on that day. A history graduate from Cambridge and a professor of modern prose, Sid Waddell is acclaimed for putting televised darts on the map, initially as a television producer for Yorkshire Television. With a mic in his hands, he played every dart, performing just as majestically as the finalist and brought both colour and flamboyance to sports broadcasting, the likes of which had never been heard before. Sid, starting with you, Indoor League, a Yorkshire television programme, really discovered televised darts. What do you recall of that? Well, all we did was we sat around in those days of uh, ITV horse trading, where Lou Grid said, I've got 20 of these soaps. And Donald Papastoke, the boss of Yorkshire television, had always wanted, <laughs> since his dad was a Skittles player, to hit the screen with a show called the Indoor League, which would feature Skittles, with swing Skittles, arm wrestling, and darts using all the technology we have in the slow motion action replay on the table football and invented the banana shot. But we came across a magnificent subculture that worked that very, it might be the fact I'm a cool miner's son, so seeing big guys with tattoos who like the paint and a bet and a few quid. Leighton Reese, amazing, from the valleys, lived with his mam, counted bolts in his store company, Alan Evans, Dad had a pub, stood on a box on the age of eight. Tommy O'Regan, Irishman, captain of the English team, could go around the board on doubles, only missing once in two and a half minutes. And these guys were playing darts in 1972-73, down in the valleys, and Langworth and John Lure playing in the Midlands for lots of money. Eric Bristow, then aged about 14, watched it, says, I want to go on there. Four years later, he won it. It was just... We found subculture, we found interesting characters, and we found sport. How did that develop into televised world championships? Uh, I think the uh, parallel idea was being had by Nick Hunter, who developed uh, rugby league and snooker. Nick Hunter had gone out to say, let's take as much hardware as we take to the Grand National, to the World Snooker Championship couple of years earlier, they'd had unearthed the greats like Thorburn, Hurricane Higgins, lads like that, eventually Davis. So they said, if we could do it with snooker, which is, some people say, not a sport, it's a pastime, why can't we do it with dots? So, Eric Bristow, you were watching all this and then you got involved. Well, I used to watch it, um, I just said 1972, 72, yeah. 73, the first one. So I was like 15, 16. But I, used, I was playing darts in, in London Super League and I was beating some of these players that were playing on TV for money. I used to play money races then. And you just had to find out how you could get, up, get onto it. So you had to join the Super League team. Then you had to play county for London. Then if you was good enough, you got picked for England. It was like a slow little moving thing to get through. And then by the time I was at 18, I got invited to the Indoor League. And uh, funny enough, I lost to a, um, 
a guy that I used to practice with all the time, a guy called Charlie Ellix, which was weird. We played in the same team, and then we played, there's eight invited players on the TV tournament, and I played my mate, which was, which was bad. I mean, Charlie was a very good player, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, it was a great tournament. As I said before, they, they tried it on TV to see how it would go. They played the table football as well. Two of my mates from Stoke Newton played that. They, they won that. And had, I remember Clive Myers was the arm wrestler and what. But the darts got the viewing figures because everybody's played darts before. Mm. And then the, I think the, the TV company was a bit uh, astounded what, what viewing figures we got. And so they thought, right, we've got something here. And obviously the BDO run it and, and they run the darts then and we had England teams and, and we just had little different sponsors come in and, and put different things on TV. Then the World Championship started a few years later. You, of course, are too young to be involved with the indoor league. Did, did, were you old enough to remember anything about it? I was still going to school social clubs, <laughs> maybe doing Cubs, I think. But uh, no, I mean, I used to watch darts. I think that's where I saw, you know, I would say John Lowe and people like Alan Glazier. Just, just love watching the darts on TV. And then my mum and dad have always played darts, so started playing and sort of picked up the game pretty quick, really. Sid, were you always convinced that darts would take off? I mean, there you were bringing these lads in from the Welsh Valleys. Did you believe then it would be big or not? I suppose, Gary, that it's a, this sort of um, subdued uh, class consciousness. My father's a coal miner. So the idea that these lots from the East End and Briggies and his mum uh, used to make chips with one hand and throw darts with the other <laughs> and this little kid practising. Eric's dad was a brilliant crib player and burger player and he taught him how to count the darts. He was like Fagin, he was taking Eric around pubs when he was 15 <laughs> with pockets full of half dollars. This is not your normal sports star. This is not how the Reverend David Shepherd was on the pitch at Lords. <laughs> yeah. They were unique. But the other thing was that we showed uh, with split screen. The darts was made for telly. One side you've got the agony and the ecstasy and in games between him and Alan Evans that was genuine aggro. Then Evans threatened to break Jockey's jaw, and he, Evans appeared to say, I'm going to thump you, you cockney so-and-so. He didn't and say on, that. It was more than that. On the, other <laughs> side, on the other side of the screen, you've got these big guys with tattoos and not a few pints, hitting precisely bits of the board. Uh, so I think, whatever, once Evans beat the News of the World Champ in 1972, when ITV had covered it briefly, and Evans had 200 supporters with plastic leaks. And you'd never seen fan mania. It does. The, the amazing thing was, Eric, I mean, you've always been in pretty good shape, and so has Keith, but there we were watching darts on television with big pints, big fat players, and smoking. I used to smoke a lot. Well, I still smoke a lot, but yeah, not I on used TV. to smoke on the yeah. screen. And, and, and it, it was sort of not the average to underline what Sid's saying, sort of sporting s spectacle. What, what, did, did anybody think about the smoking or the drinking? I mean, you know, it, wasn't, it was fashionable then. Well, the main sponsors for snooker and, and darts, they yeah. were cigarette companies, weren't they? Yeah. Embassy used to do the snooker, and, it was, uh, and they'd done a few other tournaments as well. But so that, darts, did you need the pints? I like to drink anyway. Yeah, but average. did the players need the pints? Uh, <laughs> certain players need a few, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a few of them that don't drink now. I mean, it's a different breed now, entirely. But, uh, yeah, most, see, all dart players, when you, you play in a pub, you go, well, you walk in the pub, you don't get your darts out straight away, you order a pint, your mate comes in later on, you might be on your second or third pint, he gets a pint, and you say, do you fancy a game of darts? So you've had, like, two or three before you even start. And, uh, and a lot of people just like a couple of pints just to relax. But you can't go over the top with it, you know what I mean? Some of the players drunk a lot, you know what I mean? But, well, were there uh, any players who got drunk playing? But, yeah, but they didn't last long. You know, these big tournaments, when that all started, we used to go to America and we used to play over a weekend, we used to play seven tournaments in America. And Friday night used to be the blind draw, a bit of fun. You could play with anybody. That's, that's why everybody entered it. It'd be 2,000 people in it, putting $20 a piece in, and you might play with a lady. It was a bit of fun. But it was good prize money for the winners, like $2,000 for the winner. Then Saturday, the fun started. You started at 10 o'clock in the morning, you played the men's pairs, like the mixed pairs, four man team. And you started at 10 o'clock in the morning, maybe finished at 12 o'clock at night. And then on the Sunday was the singles, you had to get up and you started at 10 o'clock in the morning again. And then all the finals were played about 7 o'clock Sunday evening. So the guys that drunk too much didn't have no chance at the end. So you just, you just drink so much, stop, have something to eat. You know how to control your old body anyway. I think the epitome was jockey, John Thomas Wilson. 
What an amazing talent. Jockey won't dart so much is when most people would be in intensive care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do I remember an exhibition with him in 1982? They let him watch the uh, Scotland match against, I think it was Brazil, and they scored a goal. Joggy had had eight pints of lager before he started throwing. He played 16 people, let a woman win, by which time he had a bottle of vodka. Then we started drinking whiskey in the bar. I was supposed to be writing his life story, but I got it with three sentences before I was down as well. And that's what finished him. Joggy walked away in 1995, uh, because Joggy wasn't really a drinker, was he? Joggy had never drank when he was at home in Kirkcaldy. He just didn't drink. But when he got with Eric and Cliff Lazarenko and Bobby George, this was the big time. Because don't forget, Jockey was, uh, was brought up in an orphanage for the first 14, 15 years of his life when he got with these lads. But the other side of the coin, when he won it, milk. <laughs> they had a picture of him when he won it in a bath with all milk everywhere. <laughs> all of the darts pictures had been beer. That wasn't <laughs> really exactly true, that. But the thing about Jockey was, he used to go, you used to follow him doing exhibitions. And Jockey used to have his own optic bottle of vodka. And it had Jockey on the label on the bottle. And he used to drink the whole bottle of vodka in a night and then turn around and say, who's been drinking all my vodka? And that was Jockey. He used to have his own 